On the day she was born in 39 BC, Julia, the daughter of Caesar D.V. Filius, was ripped from the arms of her exhausted mother, Scribonia Libo, whom her father had just divorced in order to marry another woman. Julia's father had negotiated his marriage to Scribonia, who was the aunt of Sextus Pompeius, as part of a peace treaty meant to end Pompeius's starvation of Italy, the brutality of the bloody prescriptions enacted by the Second Triumvirate, and in exchange for Pompeius's reinstatement within the Senate, as the last living son of Pompeius Magnus. Unfortunately for Pompeius, the general amnesty which accompanied the end of the proscriptions saw Sicily, Sextus Pompeius's base of operations, emptied of the senatorial refugees who had fled Rome to escape the violence. With Pompeius's position now weakened, Julia's father felt emboldened to divorce her mother. Caesar D.V. Filius dismissed Scribonia from his household, along with Publius Cornelius and Cornelia, Julia's half-siblings from their mother's prior marriages. Julia was then given over to the care of Caesar's new bride, Livia Drusilla, the woman with whom he expected to father an heir. Under the tutelage of her stepmother, and in accordance with her father's newly constructed self-image as Rome's father figure, Julia was raised in the old-fashioned way. Like girls of the Old Republic, she learned to spin wool into thread and weave thread into cloth for tunics, togas, and tapestries. She also learned the feminine arts of running the household, maintaining a budget, preparing for meals, and the choosing of staff and slaves, all in preparation for the day she would manage her own household for her husband. As the daughter of Caesar D.V. Filius, the self-titled son of the divine Julius Caesar, Julia was instructed in how to comport herself publicly, as well as in discerning just which class of the citizenry was worthy of her association. These rigorous lessons Julia practiced alongside her two stepbrothers, Tiberius and Drusus, both who'd come to live with their mother, Livia Drusilla, when Julia was a year old. As the two boys began their higher education under the mentorship of pedagogues, Julia was included, displaying a natural aptitude for and love of literature, philosophy, and culture. By the time Julia reached the age of 15, her father, now called Augustus, had still not fathered a son with Livia Drusilla, a son who would enable him to unite the Senate and the legions under the name of Caesar. Without an heir bearing his family's name, what was to stop the Senate from throwing its weight behind the rights of the ancient patrician Claudiae, like Julia's stepbrothers? And if such a thing were to happen, would the legions fight against it? After all, Julia's stepbrother Tiberius was betrothed to the daughter of Marcus Vitsanius Agrippa, a man beloved of the legions and the people of Rome. While Augustus was in Hispania, engaged in the Cantabrian Wars, Julia and Livia received word that he had fallen ill, as he so often did while on military campaign. Along with a message regarding her father's condition, Julia was instructed to marry. Her father, likely fearing he would not survive, decided to give his only daughter to her first cousin, Marcus Claudius Marcellus, the son of Julia's aunt Octavia. If the Senate wanted a Claudian to support, then let it be a Claudian who shared the blood of Julius Caesar, and more importantly, shared the blood of her father Augustus. Marcus Agrippa, always at the right hand of her father, performed the marriage rites, and when the ceremonies and sacrifices were concluded, Julia was the wife of the 17-year-old Marcellus. Immediately following her marriage to Marcellus, Julia's father began promoting her husband. Marcellus was appointed aedile, despite the office being an elected position. Next, Julia's father secured from the Senate the right for Marcellus to run for the consulship a full decade before the legal age. As her young husband's stature climbed, Julia's own popularity also rose. From within the Senate, those who supported the advancement of a patrician Claudian as the future of Rome suddenly flopped around Julia's husband in hopes that when he came into his own, he would follow the example set by Julia's father and appoint his closest friends and supporters to the highest and most lucrative offices. And so, from an austere, sheltered, and controlled life of spinning, weaving, and household management under the watchful eye of her stepmother, Julia was set free, 
immediately becoming mistress of her own household and the most important young woman of her day. Daughter to Augustus and wife of Marcellus, Julia's instant prominence saw her surrounded by an adoring social group of her own choosing, made up of the young, the carefree, and the extravagant. Not only did Julia's new social circle include her half-sister, Cornelia, and her half-brother, Publius Cornelius, but her love of literature and culture found her fawned over by a young, naive, and idealistic generation of upcoming poets, writers, sculptors, and philosophers, all of whom sought her friendship and patronage. Before long, the spotlight also exposed her to the critical eyes of her father. Not only did he disapprove of Julia's choice of clothing, which he found risque and inappropriate to her station, but he reprimanded her for associating with such a young, party-driven crowd. During a gladiatorial tournament attended by Rome's new first family, Julia was urged by her father to notice the difference between her own boisterous and extravagant friends, and those mature and distinguished people who socialized with her stepmother, Livia. Julia, known for her quick wit and sharp tongue, pointed out to her father that when she reached the same age as Livia and himself, then her friends would also be older and more distinguished. Another time, upon coming to dinner, Julia's father heartily complimented her on her dress, observing that it was much more appropriate than what she had worn the previous day. Yes, father, Julia agreed. Today I dressed for the eyes of my father. Yesterday I dressed for the eyes of my husband. But despite the fact that she and her husband were constantly thronged by supporters and sycophants, Julia's marriage to Marcellus did not please everyone in Rome. That Augustus had blithely appointed Marcellus to an office traditionally attained only via election to that office, and had strong-armed the Senate into granting Marcellus the right to stand for the highest office in the land a decade earlier than his peers, caused both concern and friction within the Senate and among the legions. Augustus Caesar, whose powers were underpinned by the legions, was only awarded this exceptional authority by a senate wishing to grant him an unprecedented personal honor and not a dynastic deed. These special offices were ultimately meant to expire with Augustus himself. But many saw the actions of Julius' father regarding Marcellus as an attempt to pass the scepter. This was unacceptable. In the midst of his quiet struggle with the Senate and legions, and with plague running rampant throughout Italy, Julius' father suddenly fell deathly ill, bringing to the fore the question of his death, his heir, and Rome's future. In a seemingly ostentatious show of deathbed drama, Augustus let it be known that he had named no heir, and had no thought of creating a dynasty. He handed the administrative aspect of Roman government back to the Senate, and assigned the legions, whose duty it was to protect Rome and to uphold the will of the Senate, to Marcus Agrippa. After her father recovered, Julia's husband, Marcellus, was the next important person to be visited by the plague. While vacationing in Baiae, Marcellus suddenly fell ill. Her father's physician, Antonius Musa, was immediately dispatched from Rome. Antonius Musa was credited with having saved Julia's father and was rewarded with a large amount of gold, an upgrade in his citizenship status from that of freedmen to freeborn, and an exemption from paying taxes. Antonius Musa arrived in Baiae, where he is said to have treated Marcellus with the same ice baths and cold compresses which had saved Augustus. But Marcellus did not recover, and Julia became a widow at the tender age of seventeen. Because Julius' father had come to realize that the legions were unmanageable in the matter of their chosen allegiance, and not necessarily wowed by a noble-born young man they were commanded to follow, he may have accepted the fact that he was destined to bend his will to the will of the legions. Alienating himself from the legions by favoring Marcellus over Agrippa, who had orchestrated every military victory, would never guarantee Julius' father the love of the legions. And so, as a result of her father's attempt to win over the absolute loyalty of legions whose allegiance was cemented to the most popular general since Julius Caesar, Julia Caesaris became the wife of Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, a man who had never failed to support her father. In order to marry Julia, 
Agrippa needed first to divorce his second wife, Marcella, who was Julia's cousin and sister of the late Marcellus. Moving into her new husband's home, Julia became stepmother to his three daughters from previous marriages, Vipsania Agrippina, who was betrothed to her stepbrother Tiberius, and two young girls named Vipsania Marcella. Although she had failed to become pregnant during the almost two years she was married to Marcellus, barely a year passed before Julia gave birth to Agrippa's first son, a healthy baby boy whom he named Gaius Vipsanius Agrippa. This son was soon followed by another daughter, Vipsania Julia, and a second son named Lucius. After a brief life of extravagant partying, Julia soon found herself on equal footing with her less boisterous and more dignified stepmother, Livia, both now esteemed as political first ladies. For Rome's holidays, festivals and religious observances, both Julia Caesaris and Livia Drusilla dutifully performed their public roles as matrons in support of Rome's two most powerful men. But Julia had done for her husband the one thing Livia could not— she had given Agrippa two sons to carry on the Vitsanier name. Then, not long after the birth of Lucius, Julia's father, Caesar Augustus, quickly claimed both her sons. Though it was common for a man with no son to adopt from within the family, her father had ripped both her boys from her. By taking possession of Gaius and Lucius, whose names now became Gaius and Lucius Caesar, Agrippa's lifelong friend had caused him to be, once again, without a single son to carry on the Vitsanier name. Soon after Caesar Augustus adopted Gaius and Lucius, taking them into his own household to be raised by Livia Drusilla, Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa once again left Rome, and Julia, the daughter of Augustus, who was now pregnant with her fourth child, accompanied him.